All right, I am very excited to introduce our next, our speaker, um, Christopher Sebastian. Christopher is a journalist, a technical writer, digital media specialist who uses pop culture, media studies, political science, and social psychology to examine human relationships with other animals. Christopher is the director of social media for Peace Advocacy Network. He sits on the advisory council for Encompass. He is a senior fellow at Sentient Media, and he is co-founder of VGN. And he lectures at Columbia University in the Department of Social Work. Whew. He has given so many talks on a wide variety of topics, and I, I think he's particularly talented at analyzing media and culture. In fact, one of his, my favorite talks that he gives is on the importance of fact-checking media and other sources. So I am just thrilled that he is able to join us at this year's Speak for Wolves. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and like, thanks to all of you for having me. That was a really impressive intro. I sound way like, I, I sound way more important than I actually am. Um, I'm super grateful to be here. And um, I will I will actually just jump right in. Um, like Rachel said, like my background is in journalism and in media studies. Um, and when I was first invited to do a talk for the Speak for Wolves conference, I wasn't sure what I would talk about because I'm not a wolf scholar. Um, or a biologist myself. Um, but like, you know, with my background in media, I like I really love to investigate like the origins of like, you know, of, of what what actually influences us in um, in, in the popular culture um, and how that changes over time. And um, and actually applying that to wolves was like, you know, was was super fascinating for me. And so I just went on this like really remarkable journey. Um, and like, you know, just to start, um, and I apologize because I've got like two different screens here and then my camera right there in the middle. So I may or may not end up looking directly at you all while I'm doing my presentation. But um, before I actually share my screen and the presentation, um, I actually just wanted to read to you something that, um, that was published in the Blue Mountain Eagle, um, which is a newspaper in, um, in Grant County, Oregon. Um, and this is from May 14th, 2019. Um, and it was a, it, it's actually a guest contribution by, um, by one of the locals, uh, Reg LeCue, and I hope that I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, and it's kind of long um, and a little bit disturbing, so content warning, it will be graphic de depictions of violence. Um, and uh, Reg actually writes, uh, why I hate wolves. Wolves kill in packs, driving, exhausting, surrounding, and terrifying until they've sing singled out an animal, infant, healthy, or aged, um, it really doesn't matter. And then they close in, uh, snapping and snarling, tearing first at genitals and bellies, mutilating and ripping, spilling intestines that would be dragged, stepped on, and seized by jaws that tear the life right out of the victim from the inside out. The term gut-wrenching takes on a whole new meaning here. It becomes a horrifying death, both frantically fast and agonizingly slow. These predators frequently settle in to feed before the victim succumbs. I have to question, the premise that we want to preserve this, even reintroduce and increase this as the fate of more and more animals. Unlike predators, the sportsman kills from a distance. There's the striking absence of eyeball to eyeball impact and the indescribable horror of claws and teeth that um, tearing the living flesh and crushing bone. There's always the desire for a humane, quick kill. There's usually that result with predators, there's never the desire for a humane quick kill. There's seldom that result. Predators put on their horror show year round, terrifying daily, killing indiscriminately. Wolves especially, um, according to LeCue, raise the stress level of the prey species exponentially 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The sportsman, by vivid contrast, hunts from afar only during two months in the fall and kills discriminately, um, selectively, the benefit to the prey species is obvious and profound. Uh, it's legitimate for man, the hunter, to largely supplant the role of the predators when we multiply and fill a geographic area. If we're going to partake of this natural bounty and utilize it for some of our food and recreational needs, we do have to reduce the predators. Then we can manage the resource harvest humanely is um, uh, a huge bonus to the resource. If they could, they would thank us for it. Um, 
like uh, and and curse us for the reintroduction of wolves. This is hilariously sad. Um, the pioneers who eliminated the wolf did so not because they misunderstood the wolf, but because they understood the wolf intimately. They witnessed the wolves' idle cruelty and wanton killing. They saw the waste of um, they saw the waste and experienced the loss of their own livestock. They learned to hate the wolf because that is what the wolf taught them to do. They responded to what they witnessed as any rational person would. Um, they were the true friends of animals. Our shared hunting heritage is tied up with values that lead to improving the human as well as the animal condition. What the proponents of predators desire will be worse for both the hunter and the hunted and the un unintended consequence will also be reduced um, opportunity to view wildlife for the non-hunter. I hate cruelty and so should you. So there's this impassioned plea but he's written to the local newspaper. And again, this was from May of 2019 um, to the Blue Mountain Eagle um, in Grant County, Oregon. Um, and anyone who's reading that would, would obviously feel that this person has great sympathy for animals um, and like in, and his hatred and mistrust and dislike for wolves is, is justified. Um, like, you know, it's, it's even like, you know, it's, it's righteous even. Um, and so therefore, like, you know, of course we would want to eradicate wolves as a means to peacefully coexist with wildlife. Um, but every single word of that is a fiction, every single word of it. There's not one relevant piece of information that was actually included in this editorial that would be supported by fact. Um, this is a person who has written from a place of, I would say, ignorance, of fear, um, and misunderstanding, um, but I really wanted to investigate how he got there. Um, I don't think that it was malicious um, on its face. I don't think that this person was writing out of like, you know, out, out of like, just like sheer anger or like, you know, his hatred of wolves just sprung up out of nowhere. Um, it came up over generations um, and like, you know, and, and reinforcing messages that we have about wolves that are incorrect. Um, so now I am going to share my screen or one of my screens actually, and start the presentation here. Hopefully you all can see it shortly. There we go. And start from the beginning. Full screen, that's it. Um, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Um, I actually re I, I, I retitled it um, after I had sent my title in to, to Rachel, um, because I often do that when I'm putting together my presentations, I rethink things after the fact. But yeah, like, you know, like, so by comparison, I actually started like reading interviews from people who are intimately familiar with wolves and who have been working with wolves for a really long time and know what they're talking about. This one is from Brenda Peterson. She is the author of Wolf Nation, The Life, Death and Return of Wild American Wolves. She writes, I was interviewing a woman last week from Defenders of Wildlife and she was distraught. She said that in Wyoming, um, which has just lifted protections for wolves, this was in 2017, a man called her to brag that he had gotten on a snowmobile, chased a wild wolf for 30 miles until the wolf collapsed from exhaustion and then he shot her. This is in stark contrast to the description of the sportsman. And I'll read again what, like, you know, what Mr. LeCure had written to the newspaper. Um, uh, he says, unlike predators, the sportsman kills from a distance, their striking abs absence of eyeball to eyeball impact and the indescribable horror of claws and teeth. Um, there's always a desire for a quick and humane kill. Um, that has not been demonstrated, I think, in, in this description of like, you know, of, of what Ms. Peterson's talking about. Um, and then there's also this, this is from John Coleman, who is the author of Vicious, Wolves and Men in America. Wolves not only perished in great numbers throughout American history, but they died in some of the most atrocious um, ways imaginable. For example, farmers, farmers dug pit traps. Once the wolves were captured, they immobilized the animals by slicing their hamstrings when the wolves were no longer able to flee or defend themselves. The farmers turned dogs on them. So this is a much more accurate representation of what happens to wolves. Um, and it like it flies in the face of the description that like Mr. McHugh had. Um, and other really like, you know, really like horrible misrepresentations of wolves exist as well. Like primarily, like, you know, we, we think of wolves as competition for like, you know, big game hunters or for farming, um, particularly cattle. Uh, like you see Amanda Radke here writing for Beef Magazine. And yes, there's actually a Beef Magazine in case you didn't know that. For many ranchers from Northern Minnesota to Southern New Mexico, predation of livestock by uh, cougars, mountain lions, and wolves carries a huge economic bite. In fact, in the lower 48 states, 5% of all cattle losses are due to wolf predation, says westernwolves.org. So like being that she's a writer for the livestock industry, 
I questioned sources and I was not entirely certain that this was accurate information. So I wanted to find out where it was coming from. I went to look for her source on westernwolves.org. Um, and um, the website actually no longer exists. Um, westernwolves.org uh, has been turned to protect the wolves. And in looking at like over 10 years of like of, of posts and trying to do a search, I couldn't find her 5% statistic um, indicating the wolves were responsible for 5% of cattle losses. I did, however, find like, you know, several pieces, and this is just a screenshot from one of them right here, saying ranchers need to stop crying buffalo and wolf they really need to stop blaming everything but themselves. All of their claims have been proven false. And then in the second paragraph, we've seen it before with the wild Mustang, horse found ups, the hunting of wolves, coyotes and other predators, black bear hunts, and now Yellowstone Park is going to send over 900 bison to slaughter to appease local cattle ranchers. So like there is just like this narrative that largely does not exist. It's literally full of misinformation, which as a journalist is something that like is incredibly frustrating for me that like you know that that there is this misinformation that's been pumped out there in the world largely by the industries of animal exploitation um and, and like you know and and this misunderstanding of wolves themselves and so like yeah like you, you, i wanted to find out what the actual numbers were and looking at like statistics from the uh from from the actual usda um losses from wolves are less than 1%. They're so minuscule. In uh, 2015, the USDA inventoried 112 million cattle in the United States. Of the, of the number, 4.5 million died from unwanted causes. Most of those deaths, 3.6 million or 3.2% um, of US cattle inventory uh, stemmed from health-related um, maladies, weather and theft. Mortalities from all predators amounted to 280,570 cattle, um, cattle deaths, um, representing a mere 0.3% of US cattle inventory, with wolves taking 0.009% of that inventory. And it's similar for sheep as well. In 2015, um, the US sheep inventory amounted to 6.8 million individuals. Um, health, weather, poison, theft, and other maladies were responsible for most ranchers and farmers' losses. 390 million, 390 million, excuse me, 390,605 sheep deaths, um, or 5.7% of the US sheep inventory. Um, in comparison, mammalian carnivores, raptors, and domestic call, dogs killed 194,395 sheep, or 2.9%. Um, of the inventory with wolves contributions amounting to 0.01% of the US sheep inventory. A lot of misinformation out there. And this is directly from the USDA. Um, statistics that were compiled in 2015 and 2014 and reported on in 2017. Um, so there is like, you know, so so again, like I wanted to investigate what were the causes of this? What led to this situation where we believe these horrible things about wolves? And, um, and I tracked down three sources. Um, one of them being folklore, mythology, like just straight up fairy tales that have been passed down um, from like the European continent to the US um, and like uh, religion being another source and, um, and, and pop culture as well. Um, and I see people are actually starting to send things in the comments. Please, I encourage you to do that. Like hold a conversation in the comments just to let me know that you're alive. Um, John is saying, you may know this, but this USDA data is based on self-reported losses, meaning it's actually more generous to livestock producers than the other figures. Um, and this is absolutely true. Like this is like, I wanted to use um, sources that would be representative from like, you know, from, from trusted, um, from, from trusted like government sources themselves. And so like, you know, like looking at that data, um, this is like, this is actually like, these are quite conservative estimates. Um, but, but yeah, like, you know, like, so in investigating this, again like like I, I identified like three different causes and and the first one I wanted to look at was of course fairy tales um like you know how we like you know the, like these are things that have been ingrained into us over generations and surely there's like mythology surrounding wolves in different cultures like you know in different places in several different continents all over the place I focused on like you know like the European continent because of course like you know like it was the European colonizers who came to the United States and brought all of um the stories with them um that like you know that that would influence our culture here. And, um, and I thought that it was really fascinating some of the stories that were told. Um, and I didn't want to focus so much on like, you know, I didn't want to focus so much on, on the like on the actual statistics, because of course, like there are going to be wolf experts or people who are actual um, wildlife biologists who are probably going to participate and do presentations themselves. Um, 
but but yeah, like so so yeah, like looking at these origins is what I wanted to focus on. Um, like the wolf in the fairy tale, um, he is depicted as manipulative and dangerous, um, either outright menacing or like disguises themselves as a good um, as a good guy in order to trick the protagonist, though a trickster. Um, like convincing people that like, you know, that, that the wolf is something that he's not. Wolf symbolism itself um, in fairy tales is that of like a, a predator, a cutting predator, if you will, um, often an intruder in the home um, and a threat to humans. Um, the wolf in fairy tale is, is evil, vicious, cunning, rapacious. Um, Proverbs also depict wolf as like a bloodthirsty killer even, um, like especially um, one that like, you know, that kills lambs in particular, which is symbolic of innocence and grace in a lot of our mythology here. Um, so, so yeah, like looking at the origins of like, you know, of, of how we consider wolves to be throughout our culture, um, like in, and where we got these stories from, like Aesop, um, of course, is one of the most fa famous storytellers. Um, Aesop's fables come to us from, like, I think, like around the sixth century. Um, like, I believe, no, I, it's 620 BC, um, like between 620 and 520 BC. Like, that's when, like, Aesop's fables were, like, mostly coll um, collected. Um, and, like, Aesop being a storyteller and slave, this is actually an image of, like, the boy who cried wolf, which is, like, one of the more popular wolf stories that we've got. Um, and I, the most ironic thing about the boy who cried wolf that I find is that, like, you know, the wolf shouldn't actually be the primary and antagonist in this tale. It's actually the boy who was lying all the time about the presence of a wolf, um, who eventually did, uh, like, finally show up um, and cause mischief. But, like, you know, it was the, 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 the human person in this tale um, who should be looked at. There's also, like, you know, Aesop had the, blind, uh, the story of the blind man and the cub. Um, like there was a blind man who had like a fine sense of touch. And so when any animal was put in front of him, if you will, he could tell what it was merely by the feel of it. Um, and one day like a, a wolf cub was given to him and put into his hands and like, and someone asked him what it was. And um, he felt it for some time. Then he says like, you know, I'm not sure um, whether it's a wolf cub or a fox. And there are so many tales about foxes as well, but I know this, it would never, do to trust it in a sheepfold. Um, and so like, you know, evil tendencies of, of, of wolves, even as, as, as babies, even as children are shown very early on. Um, we've got like more of these as well. Uh, the Brothers Grimm gave us wolf fairy tales. Um, we've got the famous like Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf, um, like, you know, who again, like disguised himself several times as a trickster. Um, and uh, you've got the story of the wolf and the fox who is sometimes um, like credited to Aesop and sometimes credited to the Brothers Grimm in the 1800s. Um, and you've got uh, the Three Little Pigs, uh, James Hallowell, who is another very popular one. Um, and so there's this mythology, like, you know, this, this sort of like wolf archetype that has been built up literally over hundreds of years and contributed to the popular culture of the time. Um, but in addition to pop culture, of course, you also have um, the Bible as well, which was like, you know, an, an unsurprising source um, for me, the Beast of Gabaldon, um, one of my favorites. Oh, that's like, I had like, I, I know that one, but I have not actually read it. Um, I should have actually included way more in this presentation, but I wanted to leave it at like about 30 minutes. Um, and, and so like, you know, because of the mythology about wolves, like, you know, all across the European continent, it's not consistent from one face to the other. Um, the wolf stories in Northern Europe are dramatically different from the wolf stories in Western Europe and in particular in England too. Um, but yeah, but again, like, you know, I, I could geek out about that for about an hour and a half. But I, I just wanted to like, I just wanted to give a brief overview of that. But Christianity being another source of like the ideas that we have about wolves, especially being the like, you know, that like there is a not insignificant population of people in the United States states who thinks of the U.S. as a, quote, Christian nation. And so it's only natural that, like, you know, we would have a lot of information about wolves that comes to us from the Bible. Um, the Bible in particular, like, mentions wolves, I think, a total of 13 times. Um, like in the book of Genesis, um, like it was interpreted in uh, medieval Europe, um, that like, you know, that, that like nature exists to serve man um, who must cultivate it and animals are made for his purposes. Um, and the wolf is re repeatedly mentioned um, in the Old Testament as an enemy of flocks. And of course you've got like, you know, the iconic images of the Christian Jesus who is a caretaker of his flock um, and a protector 
um, against actual wolves actually coming. Um, the wolf is repeatedly mentioned in the Bible um, as like, you know, as a, like, a, as a metaphor um, for evil, um, as a metaphor for like lust for power, um, and as an agent um, of Satan as well, preying on innocent God-fearing Christians. Um, and this is of course, again, contrasted with like Jesus who is like keeping his uh, flock safe. Um, like, you know, the, the negative imagery of wolves creates a sense of like of, of real devil that are, are, are prowling the world. Um, and you've got this like mentioned over and over again, like in, in, Levit in Leviticus, in uh, Deuteronomy, um, it states over and over that wolves are either agents of God sent to punish sinners or they're agents of the devil um, sent with God's blessing to harass true believers um, to test their faith. So either way, whether you're good or bad um, or whether they're sent by like God or whether they're sent by the devil, if you see a wolf in the Bible, it's usually trouble for you. Um, so that's one of the things that like, you know, one of these things that repeats itself over and over again. Um, and we also like, you know, it was actually in the Bible where we are introduced um, to the idea of the wolf in sheep's clothing. So this is like, you know, one of the origins um, or like one of the possible points of origin, of course, like there's more than one. Um, like this goes back to Greek, Greek myth as well, um, not just like, you know, the, the Christian Bible, but this is one of those points of origin um, of the idea of the wolf in sheep's clothing. And all of these, like all of these things weave together, like, you know, to form a tapestry that informs our beliefs today. Um, and so like, you know, like what ends up, what, what we asked for is like, or excuse me, what I asked, like, you know, essentially was like, you know, where, like, you know, why, like, you know, not just like, not just where these things come from, but like, but why we invented them, why we invented this mythology around wolves, why the wolf um, becomes so representative of evil um, in our world. And like, you know, and looking at psychology in the early 20th century, around the 1920s, we actually come up with the theory of the scapegoated animal, which was developed by Sigmund Freud. Um, now, according to Freud. I'm sorry, I've got to actually move the icons um, for this presentation around so that I can see my entire screen. According to Freud, people displace our hostility that we hold toward um, unacceptable targets like the, our parents, our bosses, or people who are higher up in our hierarchies in human society on to less powerful ones. So similarly, rejection refers to one's tendency to attribute one's own unacceptable feelings or anxieties onto others, thus denying them within oneself. Um, essentially what we're looking at, one of the reasons why we have like um, invented the wolf as a scapegoat is because we see um, these, these, these qualities in ourselves that we find to be like, you know, like unpleasant or undesirable and we attribute them to other animals. Um, and literally the idea of a scapegoat like, you know, comes from a goat who is like, you know, who, who is the recipient of all that's wrong in the world. Um, and so like, you know, as such, like, you know, the target of our displacement or, or projection serves as a scapegoat in this case, wolves. So like, you know, when you go back to the beginning, when you go back to like, you know, the like the, the essay um, or the editorial that was actually submitted to the newspaper by our good friend who was vilifying wolves, um, all of the qualities of wolves that you actually see being described in that piece are things that we actually see and have been like demonstrated to exist in ourselves as human people. And we project those qualities onto someone else who doesn't have the same institutional power that we do in our society. And so we see scapegoated animals all throughout, like, you know, all throughout literature, um, all throughout history, um, like, you know, and, and the very real consequences that come from that is like, you know, is, is the, the death of wolves and like, you know, and these are very real consequences because they are so endangered in particular in US American society. Um, and in addition to the scapegoated animal, um, I wanted to address the theory of becoming animal, um, which is given to us by like Deleuze and Guattari, who are two philosophers. I absolutely recommend you read up, um, read more about them. Um, this is from their work, A Thousand Plateaus, um, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Um, but like, you know, Deleuze and Guattari actually talk about like three different modes that the animal or the philosophical or theoretical animal exists in. And the first mode is the edible. Um, the edible animal um, is individualized and sentimentalized. In other words, this type of animal has a unique history and name that arises from its emotional alliance with a human. Um, they refer to this animal as edible because it's also the type of animal that Freudian psychoanalysis explores as or reduces to symbols of intimate family relationships. Um, and then the second type of, like, you know, or the second mode um, that animals occupy within human society is the union 
animal or the archetype animal. Um, this is the animal that has a symbolic presence in its rituals and spiritual beliefs of many human cultures. And so we see that through our fairy tales and through our mythology um, as described. And the third type of animal and the one that like, you know, that, that we most associate or concern ourselves with is the demonic animal. And unlike the other two types of animals, um, and like the process of becoming animal, the demonic animal has a molecular character. This is because the demonic animal, like the process of becoming animal, is a flexible and ever evolving multiplicity. Um, and so, like what we're seeing here, like you know, when we talk about like these these modes of being, um, like and like actually, like had written this in my notes. I, I'm going to read it here. Um, but like what what we're actually seeing here is like like in the in the theory of becoming animal as described by Deleuze. And Qatari. Um, it is that like animals are all a part of what we call a minoritarian culture. Um, so like they're lacking institutional power in our society. Min minoritarian groups are groups that are oppressed, prohibited, in revolt, or always on the fringe of, um, of, of recognized institutions. So like it's through their position on the fringe or on the borderline that minoritarian groups open up the space for becoming, if you will. Um, so one can speak of becoming woman. Um, because women lack institutional power in our society, um, or becoming animal, but never becoming man or becoming human, which are in many ways in US American society synonymous with being white, um, Christian, um, male. Um, and so like, you know, so so yeah, like this is like this, this theory of becoming animal, like turns wolves into objects or turns animals into objects. And we see this actually reflected in our pop culture, which as I said, is the third way. Um, that we reinforce these messages about wolves. Um, the wolf man is the perfect example of becoming animal in our culture, um, or the werewolf, if you will. Um, and the like, you know, the myth of the werewolf is like it's survived for thousands of years, but you see it like so frequently in like you know in pop culture. And I think that it's so interesting because um, like Dr. James Dodds, who is a psychotherapist, actually had written a book, um, Psychoanalysis in the Edge of um, and the Ecology at the Edge of Chaos, and um, and I actually quoted him here: the horror of such scenes talking about like you know in um in uh werewolf films um represents a kind of reversal of the scapegoat scapegoat process where the animal to be abjected instead abjects the human subject representing the transversal interstitial approach discussed by powell this concept of the scapegoat helps to relate the deleuze and Qatari's becoming animal with creed's use of christopher's abjection in relation to the primary uncanny in horror films as revealed in animal metamorphosis so the use of animal metamorphosis in film, like the reason what the, the reason why it's so scary, what makes it so scary is because we actually see the reality of like human and animal identities being merged and the subversion of the human against our will. So all of those qualities that we actually project onto other animals, in this case, the wolf, are qualities that we end up having to assume ourselves in this like animal metamorphosis, in this reversal, if you will. Um, the animal actually abjects the human subject um, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Um, and that that frightens us as humans. It's something that we would ultimately fear because of the things that we project onto other animals, the violence that we actually like, you know, that, that we and undertake every single day toward other animals. And in this case, wolves, um, like, you know, is, is something that we actually have to reckon with or a discomfort that we actually end up having to sit with. And that is part of the process of fear um, that, like, you know, that is being explored or that is being unpacked packaged in our psyche when we watch films like um like like werewolf films or, or wolf band films um but like there are positive representations as well as you can see here like i don't know how many people actually watched once upon a time i thought that it was a brilliant tv show but the marriage of like red riding hood and the wolf as the same individual in the show is a representation of becoming animal um like you know and becoming woman simultaneously at the same time um which actually is a reclamation of the wolf's power and majesty um, as it should be recognized in our culture. Um, and we see positive representations or these reclamations of wolf identity actually being like undertaken all the time. Um, this is just huge fun for me because we're actually looking at Twilight here in this slide. Um, and like, you know, like, I, I don't know, like, you know, Taylor Lautner was probably pretty young in that film. But um, if you like me were like, you know, we're, we're 17 when you're consuming this and like you were probably wild for the ideas of vampires and werewolves actually working together. Um, and like, you know, Teen Wolf as well, um, which was an MTV show that we saw pretty recently, um, like, you know, that, that, that again, like has this representation of the wolf, not as like, you know, as a monster, 
but as a tragic figure. Um, and I think that that's actually one of the, like, you know, one, one of the most provocative and like, you know, and, and poignant things that we can see. Because in reality, the wolf is a tragic figure in our, like, you know, in our society. Like we've literally hunted them to the brink of extinction repeatedly. Um, and as of right now, I believe like the gray wolf has been delisted in 2021 from the um, endangered species list. Um, and and that's a scary, that's a scary thing. That's a, like, we're living in a very scary time for wolves. And so like, you know, to actually like represent wolves as tragic figures is a much more accurate representation of them in like, you know, in, in like not just human society, but in particular in US American society. Um, and like, you know, the more that we can actually reclaim wolf identities, like, you know, perhaps not with like marrying them with, with actual actual humans, but um, the, the the more we're actually able to explore wolves as individual persons who are belonging um, in our society and who deserve space in our society. And so that's where I wanted to leave the presentation. Um, like I said, like, you know, like these three origin stories, like, you know, through myth, through popular culture and through religion were just like points of entry into like, you know, the things that like we, like the ways that we have kind of like reinforced these messages around wolves. And um, and I'm hoping that like, you know, that, that we have better ideas ideas about them in the future. And I think that we will. Um, I think that we will. I think the future generations are probably going to look back at the way that we have treated like the natural world at large um, and certain species in particular as like villains, um, like, you know, in, in human society when it's actually been humans the entire time that have been like, you know, that, that have been absolutely pillaging um, and, and, and breaking our fundamental relationships with the natural world um, in the name of civilization, in the name of like, you know, animal agriculture in the name of all of these things that we think of as somehow superior in human society. Um, like we have to break with that. And I think that like, you know, current and future generations are reckoning with that in a very, very poignant and major way. So thank you. Thank you for, um, for sitting through my presentation. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I loved you covering all of the fairy folk tales. I read um, Grimm's Folk tales, like they were very, as you might, the title implies grim, <laughs> very graphic, and Aesop and all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting to me that that some people come away with the wolf as a villain, like you mentioned, and others, I mean, to me, they were just stories. Like, you know, clearly I don't see wolves as, as something dangerous, and I never really did as a kid, but I read all that same information and, you know, I went to church and consumed all of that. So it's interesting that some people come away with, with still seeing the wolf as a villain and others can take it for, for just, you know, a fairy tale and it doesn't have any, you know, reality behind it. <laughs> I don't know if you have a comment about that or yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, like, this is the thing, like, we internalize these messages all throughout our childhood and into our adult years, whether or not, like, we realize it or whether or not we do it consciously. And so, like, I never thought of these things either um, myself, like, you know, as a child growing up. But, like, but of course, like, you know, we have scapegoated animals, um, again, biblically and, and, and also in folklore all the time. Um, and, like, you see, like, the, the tales that we tell ourselves about snakes or serpents or bugs um, as, like, icky or evil or gross, um, like, you know, that that comes from someplace and we never really interrogate like where these things come from or why we feel the way that we do we just know that we do but can you just imagine like you know like what our relationship with other species in the natural world would be if we didn't have the messages that we did um, as we were growing up and that were constantly being reinforced for us through popular culture, through like, you know, our shared histories and through legend over time. Um, like, you know, I am a recovering, like, you know, like spider phobe or arachnophobe. Um, like, you know, I'm like, I'm still very terrified when I see spiders, no matter how small they are. Um, but like, you know, but I have to like, there, there's all of this, these layers of conditioning that I have to unlearn around certain animal species. Um, um, that, that I was given growing up, growing up and like, you know, and, and how I would probably feel about spiders like, you know, today, if I didn't have to like, we like sort through all of that, like all of that chaff that has been given to us. And the same thing is true of wolves. Like, you know, like when I, whenever I ask people like, you know, how they feel about wolves or why they like, you know, think the way that they do about them, it's always the same answer. Oh, wolves do this, wolves do that. And it's like, you know, this sort of like recitation of the same things that we were listening to in the beginning in that editorial that was written to the newspaper. Um, and of course, none of those things are true. 
through. Like this is just misinformation and disinformation through like, you know, through, through, through several, several different like years um, and several different sources that we come up with. Um, and like, you know, and we, and we regurgitate because it's what we know or like, you know, or what we've been taught. And so it's just this continual process of unlearning over and over again. I have heard as I'm sure others have heard the same myths repeated about wolves carrying away children, which is not a thing. <laughs> but still, people. That's one of the Northern European ones. Yeah, like that's like that's a, that's a, that's such a popular one. Um, like wolves, like wolves are always going to kidnap your babies. Like it's it's like and and again, like all of these things we project onto other animals. Um, like you know, like cats or stealing babies' breath or or things like that. Like it's like it's wild. It's wild the stories that we invent. Um, but but again, like you know, so much of it is like it's it's just like it's all about spoken words. It's it's, it's like it's all it's all a fiction. Okay, so I'm going to get to some of the um, other questions. From Shana, we have, um, she's asking about fairy tale misconception of wolves is largely what inspired my pending NPO, Big Bad Wolves, education on what wolves are truly like is our main mission. And we have our own ideas about how to go about combating literally hundreds of years of negative mythos. But what steps do you see needing to be taken to change the perception of wolves as a non-biologist? Oh boy, um, this gets into like once again the media representations, and I think that like part of that process is like you know is reclaiming the wolf, um, and like you know and like sort of not romanticizing it, but like you know but because like I think that there's a certain danger in that as well, um, and we see this with like native peoples um, too, like you know the, the the trope of like the noble savage is something that comes to mind in human communities where we sort of romanticize rather than actually look at the true lived experiences and identities of like you know of these communities, um, and I think that that's something that we really need to invest ourselves in coming up with new stories um new stories of the natural world and that relate to the natural world in meaningful ways that we can like you know tell ourselves and tell our children um that like you know that, that don't paint like you know this this picture of the natural world as like as dangerous um as like you know as something to be feared um and that's also very freudian that's also something that like you know that, that comes to us from psychology the idea that like you know that the civilization is something that we should strive for has really like you know broken our relationship with other species in like, you know, in a very dangerous way um, and has led to like the current climate um, crisis or catastrophe that we're like, that we're currently facing. Um, like, you know, the, the perceived superiority of human communities, the perceived superiority um, or exceptionalism of like, you know, of, of the civilized world versus the natural world is like, you know, is incredibly dangerous. And so like now is like a really like pivotal moment, um, which is like really scary, but also like very, very exciting because we have the opportunity to reframe like you know the narratives that, that we teach ourselves and so like you know from a non-biological point of view um i think that we're living in a time of such information right now um that like you know that, that we have the ability to reconstruct these relationships um like you know and using our media to do it thoughtfully and uh, like you know and and with with care and with sensitivity um rather than like you know through through fear mongering and campaigns of disinformation and like you know and bigotry toward other species um that breeds intolerance and and like you know and and literally like you know feeds upon the violence that we that we we in like that, that we like just bring about to to everyone else around us and also i think the shana is remarkable for writing this and i cannot wait for it Uh, okay, so we've got a bunch of other questions. One of them is from John. Um, he asks, he'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on how wolves are often used as a proxy for a sort of anti-government, anti-interventionist ideology. And on the inverse, how wolves are often sanctified and the suggestion that all you need to do to save the environment is to reintroduce some wolves. Wow, that is, first of all, like there are so many parts of that question. Um, I'm going to start at the end and work my way back. Um, yeah, like, you know, like like romanticizing, as I said before, that's something that we want to absolutely avoid. Um, like, you know, like there has to be truth telling in like, you know, in the stories that that, that we create and that we craft. Um, and like, you know, like, and so the idea that like, oh, we're just going to reintroduce wolves and everything will be great um, is like, you know, that's that's not an accurate depiction. Um, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not couched in reality. Um, and like, what, what else was it? Oh yeah, like the idea of like, you know, the the, the use of wolves as metaphors, we see that very frequently as anti-establishment um, and like, you know, 
um, and anti-government or like, you know, like as like the, the, the wolf as like as as the state, if you will, um, or as a representation of the state. Um, we see pigs in the same way. Um, and that drives me like, you know, that, that drives me around then whenever I see people like, you know, representing pigs. Um, as like you know as as police um or as a stand-in for like you know like bad policing um or examples of bad policing because that's absolutely not true and it has real consequences for these animals like you know like i've seen in um like you know in in protests where people are absolutely holding up the the, the heads of, of pigs um like you know and like you know as a as like which is a, that's an act of violence to me at least um like you know and like and this has consequences for wolves too like you know people feel like like, you know, in in using wolves in this way, um, or like, you know, or using wolves as a metaphor for like, you know, for, for something, it is like it, it does a disservice to the wolves, but it also does a disservice to us in human communities. Um, because again, like, you know, we're projecting something onto like another group of like, you know, of marginalized persons or minoritized persons. Um, in the case of wolves, um, that like you know that, that largely doesn't exist. Don't create representations of like you know don't create animal representations of humans um, that like you know that 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 we fear that we dislike or like you know that that we otherwise like have a problem with. Um, when we do so, like you know we're in many ways hiding um, the the at the actual problem. We're disguising like, like those persons. Um, with these animal metaphors, um, let the state be the state. Like, you know, I'm very anti-establishment myself. Um, like, you know, I have my problems with capitalism. Like, I think that capitalism absolutely drives a lot of the bigotry and intolerance towards other species that we currently experience. Um, and like, you know, and as such, like, you know, wanting to have a more peaceful world for other animals and for humans as well, who are being like, you know, who, who like live with institutional disenfranchisement. Like, you know, like, I think that it does a disservice to ourselves and to like, you know, and, and to the people that we want to protect when we create these representations. Let the, like, you know, let the actual, like, you know, institutions and persons who run those institutions be who they are. Um, and let's see them for who they are. And usually they're wealthy, um, wealthy men in suits. Um, we don't need wolf representations of those people. Those, those people are who they are. Um, and like, you know, and, and reimagining them as like, you know, as, as quote, animals who are like, you know, who are monsters, um, lets them off the hook. I don't want to do that. So that's that's my answer for that question. I hope I hope that that is is satisfactory. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, there's a comment from Shauna. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we have several questions just about how to counter the narrative, but I feel like you already answered that in terms of you know your the driving message that we need to tell the truth about the wolves and create our own stories. Um, we, uh, there's a, not a question, but more of a, um, a statement from Anne who said that she thought of Farley Mowat in one of his books. And the quote from his book is, we have doomed the wolf not for what it is, but for what we deliberately and mistakenly perceive it to be, the mythologized epitome of a savage, ruthless killer, which in reality, no more than a reflected image of ourself. That is the truth. It is the absolute epitome. Like I, I like I rock with that quote hundred percent. The whole presentation could have been saved, and we could have just like put that quote on the screen, and it would have been like you know, and that would have like that well that would have encapsulated the whole thing. That's the truth. Like you know, like that that really is. Like you know, we 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 use rules as a stand-in for who we actually are as people. Um, and, and yeah, like, you know, like there is this, like this perception of like these, these animal monsters that we have created. Um, and like, and we see it with so many different types of animals. It's not just the wolf man, um, but like, you know, we see this with like sharks. Um, like, you know, like because of the representations of sharks that we have in the media, because of the films that we've made about sharks, um, the great ape, like, you know, representations of like the giant ape, um, like film after film after film about King Kong, um, tied up in like, you know, our misconceptions about animals, about the natural world, about race, um, about how we perceive other persons, like, you know, like there are so many dangerous things that we do. Um, and all of these are human constructions. All of these are like, you know, our projections onto other animals who are literally just trying to live their best lives out here um so so yeah like you know it's, it's very real and so i really really appreciate that comment that's an excellent excellent quote thank you okay we've got um a question from mary ann 
one of the points made in the new handbook on reforming wildlife agencies is that the term predation is a more accurate description than depredation when it comes to wolves taking livestock because it removes the idea of evil savage intent. Absolutely. Um, and, like, and, and yeah, like here again, like, you know, the, the use of those very specific words, evil and savagery, um, like, you know, like, because like, we, we, we presume that there's something evil going on here. Like, you know, wolves are carnivorous animals they eat. Like, you know, like, that's like, that, that's not something that is like, you know, inherently evil. Um, and like, you know, but we've, we've, we've attached that descriptor um, to it, um, to, to, to their actions. Um, and like, and savage is something like, you know, that's an incredibly, incredibly loaded word. Um, and again, this ties into our perceptions of other animals that, um, that, that is an extension of our perceptions that have to do with race, because so frequently we have used the word savage to describe other people, um, in particular indigenous people, black and brown people around the globe. And so like the, the use of the word savage um, to describe someone um, like irrespective of their species membership, race, ethnicity, or social class is always meant to like, you know, to, to, to depersonify them in many ways. Um, and so like, you know, those, those perceptions of evil and savage are very, very specific. Um, and they are like, you know, and, and intentional, I think in many ways. And so like, you know, the framing of, of wolves as such, um, like that, that, that's very real. Um, and so like, you know, like, like decentering or moving the conversation away from those words um, and avoiding the use of them, um, like, you know, that, that already is a step in a positive direction. I have a very small, like, canine friend who is like looking at me from the side of the room right now. He is sick and tired of me being like, you know, like sitting in front of a screen. He always does this when, because he doesn't understand like why I'm talking to the computer. Um, and like, I've got my like ear, ear pods in and like, you know, he's like, there he goes. He's just doing this wacky thing again. He's just talking to himself for no reason. He doesn't understand the concept of screens and video and calls. I have a, a cat that is uh, notorious for yelling at me uh, whenever I'm giving a public comment in <laughs> So it's me and my cat meowing. <laughs> um, Always. And, but I've, something I've noticed when I attend the um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife WAG meetings is often you have the ranchers and that's the, um, sorry, the wolf advisory group. And it's a group of, of uh, people that are various stakeholders. But the ranchers so often complain bitterly about the wolves taking their cows, which is curious to me because their cows are all, they're all going to the slaughterhouse. They're all dying. It's not that they particularly care about these, these cows per se. And it strikes me as more maybe like an ownership issue and that they're pissed that that wolf has the tenacity to take, take something that is really, that is theirs. Do you have any comments about that whole, I don't, know how to really reframe my question but yeah I do um I sure I, I I indeed I do have like comments about that like you know I myself think that like you know it would absolutely behoove us um as a species if we abolish the commodity status of other species um I think that that is one like and again like you know so much of like you know so much of the work that I do and so much that like you know that 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 I learn about, um, and so much of the scholarship that like you know that I personally engage in, um, has to do with like a like you know a total liberation and b um, is a critique of capitalism, um, and like you know and I have a vested interest as a person like you know with a lineage um, and with a genealogy of like you know of, of coming from like you know a people who were subjugated and treated as property like you know like the idea that like the property status of anyone irrespective of their species. Um, should be maintained is to me a, a, a absolute blasphemy. Um, and, and so like, you know, as such, like, you know, like what has been done to me, what like, you know, and the experiences of my people and the inter intergenerational trauma that we have experienced as a result of like, you know, of, of 400 years of this, um, like, you know, it, de it definitely informs my position on, um, on, on the status of other animals. Um, and like, you know, and all of this is about capitalism. All of this is about ownership and like, you know, and our perceived right to someone else's life and someone else's bodily autonomy. Um, like, you know, it's like, you know, it is an absurdity. Um, and so like the idea of like cattle ranchers, like which is incredibly, unbelievably um, and historically colonial 
um, to begin with. Like, you know, like, like having the, the sheer audacity to like, you know, to, to think that wolves are like, you know, are wrong or evil. Um, and even, especially when it has not been demonstrated that they are responsible for like, you know, the net grillions and squillions of deaths that, you know, among cattle that like, that we, that we make it out to be. Like, you know, that, that the wolves are taking something that actually belong to them. Um, the lives of animals only belong to the animals themselves. Um, and so like, you know, the, that, that is like, you know, that, that entitlement, um, like, you know, that is like, it's, it's astounding to me. It's absolutely like, you know, it's, like it's astonishing um, and it is incredibly, incredibly disappointing. Um, and ultimately it is hypocritical. Um, and I have to say that because again, like you don't actually care about the lives of these animals. You only care about the lives of these animals insofar as you are able to use them as exploitable resources. And that is the crux of the situation. You are going to kill these animals yourself anyway. Um, and the idea that a wolf beat you to it is what makes you angry. And that hypocrisy, um, that like, you know, that, that, that ignorance, um, a, a studied willful ignorance, um, and like, you know, and, and the incredible like entitlement of it all is to me reprehensible. Um, and it, it speaks to like, you know, everything that is wrong with our relationships with other animals. And it speaks to everything that is wrong with capitalism. And it speaks to exactly why we are where we are right now with the environmental crisis that we're currently facing. Thank you. I, that was very, much better than I could have ever said it, <laughs> which is why you're talking to not me. <laughs> okay, um, so we have another question from Amaruk. Uh, in, she says, in 2012, there was a published table of views between an expert in wolf biology and an expert in social science around wolves. The biologist in a published paper asserted that scientists and the news media were sanctifying wolves. In support of this argument, he cited 11 news articles as evidence of bias. The expert in social science around wolves published a letter in response. He noted in 2020 study that the first expert completely overlooked. The 2010 study reviewed more than 6,000 news articles totaling 3,000, so excuse me, 30,000 paragraphs of text, and they found that 70% of the paragraphs coded over a 10 year period portrayed wolves negatively. Given this scenario, and that so many of us speak to the press constantly about wolves and try our best to explain to reporters why so many of the themes presented in the news is inaccurate, still we see this trend continue in reporting. Any thoughts on how to shake the worldview of news reporters and change this dynamic? Yeah, um, we need more like we, we need more and better um, environmental reporting, um, like hands down, um, like as with most things. And this is part of like, you know, why I actually work in journalism myself, um, like, you know, and, and why more people should be working in the social sciences um, who are like, you know, who are like the people who I think um, are attending this conference. Um, like, you know, there is there is an anti-animal bias that exists in the media just as much as there is um, an anti-woman bias, as much as there is an anti-Black bias. Um, and like, you know, one of my like sociology professors in, in university, like, you know, actually said to me one time, which like sparked, like, you know, like, you know, this, this, this sort of lifelong, um, like, like ambition of mine, like it's the people who hold the pens who hold all of the power. Um, like, and I'm sure you probably heard the phrase before from like, um, like uh, the, it's an African proverb. Um, and I can, now I can't, it's the author of like a thousand splendid sons, I believe, and things fall apart, um, things fall apart. Um, but, but yeah, like it is like, you know, until the lions have their own historians, his, historians the glory of the hunt um, shall always belong to the hunter. Um, and so we need more pen holders. We need more like, you know, historians. We need more journalists. We need more writers. We need more like, you know, documentarians who like, you know, who, who actually, sorry, I don't know what happened there or why that happened. I apologize for that. Um, like my internet just decided that it was like way too much for one day, um, I suppose. But like, I guess like I, I am out of time anyway and I should probably wrap up um, to make way for the next speaker. Uh, I think we might have one more question. Let's let me check because we do have a break between oh, sure. you and the next speaker. Um, there, there's first of all just a lot of praise for your talk. I just want to <laughs> emphasize that there's 
a lot of people that especially love your um, discussion about, you know, the animals' lives just belong to themselves. And there's, uh, you just have a lot of fans here in the, in the chat loving your talk. So uh, I just want to extend that appreciation. Um, Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna ask this one uh, last question here. Why has there been such little emphasis on the fact that wolves are native species that co-evolved with our local ecosystems while cows and sheep and farm, I'm gonna say farm animals, um, that's a quote I put in there because I don't like calling them farm animals, anyway, are not native and do not perform ecosystem service and goods that, that make the planet inhabitable for all life. Oh boy, there's such a person that farmed animals, in quotes, um, that, that they do contribute because of like this, this idea or all of these ideas around like regenerative, regenerative agriculture. Um, and like, I, boy, that's a whole other presentation. Like, don't get me started on that. Um, like, you know, in, in my career or in, in my other life as a technical writer, I have like, you know, participated in like helping to write um, and edit like, you know, sections for reports for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, like, the, like the US Forest Service, the National Park Service, um, like the Bureau of Land Management. And there is like, you know, there's so much talk about like regenerative agriculture and the role that like these large ungulates, um, like, you know, and, and um, these, these species that of farmed animals, like you know, play in um, in maintaining in maintaining the land, um, and it's all absurd. It's all absurd. Um, and, and there's like a great deal of money, a great deal of lobbying that goes into it. Um, and like the idea that like you know that the, the other species of free living animals um, are like you know like are, are somehow a threat to like you know to the 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 natural biodiversity of of the lands. Um, is is an equal measure, like you know, a myth um, and an absurdity, and like you know, and just like, and here again, like you know, I really do appreciate the use of like of of like wolves um, as like you know as as native um, and as indigenous. Um, I really think that like it would benefit us to expand our understanding of like you know of indigenous like persons and like, you know, and personhood in general um, to include other species because like there's no, ab there's absolutely no like biological reason why person um, or like, you know, as an identity should only belong to humans. Um, especially since like, you know, personhood and like, you know, and, and the identity of human itself um, has historically only been given to like a very, like very finite um, classification or very specific designation of human, one of which, like, you know, I historically have been his, um, excluded from myself. And so, like, you know, our understanding of persons, like, you know, like, should be, like, extended to other people, um, like, you know, of varying species, um, simply because, like, you know, we, we share this world with them. Like, you know, we, we're always talking about things like life on other planets and like, you know, and, and how we would, I like, I fear for like, you know, finding life on other planets because I have absolutely no idea what, like what we would do with it. Given that we have this beautiful diversity of life on this planet right here and all of these other species that have their own cultures and that have their own like languages that have their own societies that we disrupt, that we dismantle, that we like, you know, that we commit horrific acts of genocide against, um, that we imprison, that we enslave, and that we like, you know, that, that we institutionally disadvantage and disenfranchise left, right, and center, and bombard completely out of extinction. Um, and, and so, yeah, like, you know, the expansion of, like, you know, of, of, of persons to other, like, animal communities um, and remembering um, and being humbled by the fact that we are ourselves a species of animal would be, like, a benefit to us, a net benefit. Um, and, like, you know, the loss of that understanding, like, you know, or, or our, like, our learned forgetting of that understanding um, and the, like, you know, the, the, exceptionalism of the human experience and in particular like you know the western um like human experience like you know that is that's so toxic um it is like you know it's it's like it is like it, i i can't even find words to articulate or articulate or describe like you know the the damage that it has done um and i mean the psychic damage as well as the like you know the the physical damage that we can see our world is on fire 
Um, and like, and even now, even now, um, in the burning of the world that we are witnessing with our mobile phones firsthand, like, you know, like our, our focus can't even be with like the other species that have lost their homes and their lives and the beautiful, beautiful biodiversity that is lost because of our selfishness, because of our greed, because of our desire to like, you know, to exploit all other living persons on this planet. Um, like, you know, like I just like I, I could go on and on about that, but but really like, you know what? Yeah, like recognizing like the sovereignty of, of other species um, and finding solidarity with them, finding solidarity with black and brown people around the planet, finding solidarity with native people, with indigenous people, with First Nations people. Like, you know, like it is like, it's necessary to like restore, like the, like, you know, to, to restore our planet. Um, and like, it, like I, I wanted to say like, you know, we don't have a lot of time left, but literally we're out of time. Like we're just trying to mitigate the damage um, and present, prevent ourselves from falling into a state of managed decline with other species. But one of the steps that like would be necessary in order to heal, um, like, you know, ourselves psychologically as well as like, you know, the, the physical natural world um, is to recognize the personhood and the sovereignty of, of other species that we share this planet with and to abolish that property status um, once again. So, so yeah, like, you know, like the, like the idea that like, you know, that, that farmed animals or like, you know, or, or animals whose like, you know, whose, whose like bodily autonomy we have stolen um, as like, you know, as, as somehow like an environmental benefit um, and like, you know, and deriding or degrading um, like, you know, the, the, like, you know, the lives of free living animals. Um, like, you know, it is, it's, it's to me, like, again, like I say, reprehensible. Thank you. I literally get tingles up my spine when you're talking about all of this stuff. It's, I guess you just say it so well. Um, I hate that we need to let people go and, and uh, take a, a break. And I'm sure you would like a break yourself, though. <laughs> uh, I really hope that people listen to what Christopher has said. We will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel later once we um, are able to get it up. Um, we've posted links to Christopher's website and his Patreon in the chat, so please do check that out. Um, he, uh, for sometimes when, for his Patreon supporters, he gives um, basically like, I, I don't want to say bonus, but you get access to some of his talks, which are equally fascinating. <laughs> uh, I could just go on and on, but I don't want to embarrass you overly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me here today. I really, really appreciated it. And I appreciate everyone's kind words and like, you know, and had a really, really great time. And I myself am actually not in the US, um, although I am American, I'm living in Prague right now. So like I am nine hours ahead of you. Um, and so like, you know, being able to do this is an absolute gift. I appreciate you giving me a time slot early in the morning so that I would be able to participate and not have like a super late bedtime. Um, and like, you know, this has been an absolute blast. Um, like, you know, I really like, you know, I, pre I appreciate the organizers and, um, and in general, all of the work that you do and everyone who's attending this conference, I like, you know, I'm really glad that you're here. <laughs>